Hello, class. Uh, back for lecture number two for History 101. And as promised, this particular lecture is on the French and Indian War in the North Country. So you're going to want to open your books to page 110. That's what I'm looking at in front of me. And the first battle that you can see that happens in our own backyard happens in 1755, a prelude to the war, is the Battle of Lake George. This battle takes place between the French and the British at the southern end of Lake George. Uh, presently today, there's a picnic area and a park there. It's uh, down at the southern end before you get to the Million Dollar Beach. The battle took place there. The British defeated French forces there, which allowed them to build a fort at the southern end of Lake George. And that fort that they built is Fort William Henry. Now, Fort William Henry, many of you have, may have been there if you've gone to Lake George. It's a privately owned fort. You can tour it. And uh, I really wouldn't waste the price of admission on Fort William Henry. There are better sites to go to like uh, Fort Ticonderoga. But regardless, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. It's been reconstructed. It sits right at the southern end of Lake George. So the French end up building a fort up at what amounts to the northern end of Lake George at the mouth of the Le Chute River, which empties Lake George into Lake Champlain. And that fort is called Fort Carrion. You know it better as Fort Ticonderoga, but it won't be called that until the British capture it a few years later. But anyway, the French send troops down onto Lake George from Fort Carrion to attack and capture Fort William Henry. This will be a long, bloody battle. Many of you may have seen the film The Last of the Mohicans before. It's about that battle and what happens afterwards. It's a pretty accurate film. It's worth watching. Uh, but ultimately, the French and their Indian allies will capture Fort William Henry, Henry, excuse me, after days of laying siege to it, which means bombing it nonstop with cannon. The British hold out as long as they can. The French respect them for their valor. And in the negotiations for the surrender, they agree to allow them to have safe passage back to the nearest British fort, which is Fort Edward on the Hudson River. So according to this agreement, what's left of the British forces, and there are some of their families there, families accompanied British troops in North America, the people that survived will have a peaceful passage or march down to Fort Edward. And that's the settlement agreed upon. Now, sort of in similar fashion to what happened at uh, the massacre at Deerfield, uh, this is going to backfire on the French because their Indian allies who came with them from up on the St. Lawrence River Valley, typically when there was a big victory like this, they would get to pillage the fort, take captives, capture everything inside, and that was their take for assisting the French. The French told them, this time you can't do that. We're allowing these people safe passage back to Fort Edward. Their Indian allies felt betrayed by their French officers. So what's going to happen uh, when the British go to march peacefully without weapons back to Fort Edward there will be a sneak attack on them by the Native American allies of the French. This is commonly known as the Great Betrayal. And these people will be murdered at a place called Bloody Pond. A few handful will escape. You might remember this from the last of the Mohicans. But most of them will be brutally killed and all their belongings will be taken by these Native allies. The French did not authorize this, but they're still responsible for the actions of their native allies. 
This is really going to rile up support for the British effort all across New England when the word of this great betrayal spreads. And it's really unfortunate for the French because this is going to backfire on them. They do capture Fort William Henry, but in the long run, lose because of the great betrayal. So what's going to happen next in 1758, the British decide to amass a gigantic force to march north and capture Fort Carrion, which you know as Fort Ticonderoga, which sits at the mouth of the Lachute River on Lake Champlain. The British will have a force of nearly 16,000 men, which is unheard of at this point in history. The commander of this British force will be General Howe. The French at Fort Carrion will be commanded by French General Montcalm. He is going to be greatly outnumbered. He's only going to have 3,500 troops. And if you look at the Fort Ticonderoga website that I gave you uh, links to, you can see a lot of this story on there. Now, what's going to happen here are two significant events. One, a day before the British actually attack Fort Carrion, their commander, General Howe, will be killed in a scrimmage that uh, is between a French scouting unit and some British regulars. He will be shot and killed in what is today the village of Fort Ty, near where the hospital is. Now, with him gone, that puts General Abercrombie in charge of the British Army. He is not an experienced battlefield general. He's essentially a pencil pusher. He's way out of his realm, and he doesn't know what he's doing. He's going to order this head-on attack on Fort Carrion with his 16,000 men, thinking they'll march into place, set up cannon, lay siege to the fort, similar to what the French did to Fort William Henry, and that'll be the end of the story. But General Montcalm is a brilliant general. He knew if he stayed put in the fort, he was done. He's outnumbered 16,000 to 3,500. So he moves out of the fort approximately about a mile to the west of the fort. If you've been there, this is the area labeled the French lines. He'll have his men dig trenches, build big piles of dirt, and on top of the dirt behind these trenches, they'll place what's known as abattis. Abatee is sharpened sticks, fallen trees. It's like the barbed wire of the French and Indian War. His men will all be secure in their trenches behind the abatee, and the British will march right into them. On that day, the British will be slaughtered. The British will lose somewhere in the neighborhood of two to 3,000 men in an afternoon because they marched right into a trap. This will be a gigantic victory for General Montcalm and the French and a huge embarrassment for General Abercrombie and the superior British forces. Now, that's a big setback for the British. A big victory that occurs for the British that you can see on your map is they will attack Louisburg again. This time, they'll send a naval force from Britain. They know better than to ask troops from New England to do it again because they gave it back in the previous war and they weren't about to volunteer. So General Wolfe will lead a huge flotilla. They'll lay siege to Louisburg and they'll capture it in 1758. This sets the stage for the eventual capture of Quebec or Quebec City, as we call it today, the following year. Remember, this has always been the target of the British, the capture of Quebec, because you capture Quebec, you control New France. So, 1758 had the failure at Fort Carrion, had the big victory at Louisbourg for the British. The next year, in 1759, 
the British will attempt to attack Fort Carrion again, and the French will know this is coming. The French are receiving orders down in the Champlain Valley that it's time to fall back to the north because they know Louisburg has been captured and the next big target is going to be Quebec. So General Montcalm is ordered to abandon Fort Carrion, and he does and sets it afire before the British even arrive there. So the British capture Fort Carrion without a battle this time. They capture a burned out fort. Now, also in 1759, just a few a week or so later, the French have another very significant fort just north of what becomes Fort Ticonderoga at Crown Point. The French fortress there, which you'll see links to in the lecture, is Fort St. Frederick. Now, the French will also receive orders to abandon this very significant fort at the Straits at Crown Point, which controls uh, Lake Champlain, and fall north to Montreal and Quebec City. So the French will explode uh, gunpowder charges in the very impressive fort, Fort St. Frederick, which sat right down on the water's edge. If you look at the website, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, and blow it up and escape to the north to Montreal and ultimately Quebec City to defend Quebec City. Now the British have quickly captured Fort Carrion, which they renamed Fort Ticonderoga, and they captured Fort St. Frederick, which they renamed His Majesty's Fort at Crown Point. Now, a new commander will take over the British Army, who is responsible for these two captures. They aren't victories because the French abandoned them. That's General Geoffrey Amherst. Amherst has a group of soldiers attached to him known as Rogers Rangers. There are links on the class website in the Century of Conflict to Robert Rogers and his Rangers. Explore those so you know who they're all about. He is going to send Robert Rogers and his Rangers on a reconnaissance mission to sort of lay the stage for the capture of Quebec City. This famous reconnaissance raid is going to be Robert Rogers' raid on St. Francis. It's a Abenaki village on the St. Lawrence River. Amherst is interested in how many French troops are stationed between Montreal and Quebec City because that's where he and his men will be invading from. General Wolfe and his men will be invading from the east from Louisbourg, which they captured the previous year. So, Robert Rogers and his rangers go to this sleepy Abenaki village unfortunately slaughtered innocent natives. And in response, natives rise up from the whole region and kill most of Robert Rogers and his rangers. Robert Rogers and a handful of them will escape to the south down the Connecticut River and will end up at Fort Number 4, where they will seek sanctuary, lick their wounds, and end up reporting back to Amherst at Crown Point later that summer. This all happened in June. Now, this sets the stage for the famous capture of Quebec City, which you can see a famous painting of this capture that happens on September 13th, 1759, in your book on page 113. General Wolf and his men will pull off a brilliant strategy They'll sneak up on the city in the middle of the night using an extremely high tide that will make the St. Lawrence River flow backwards on the night of September 13th, 1759. It's such an extreme high tide. His ships will slip in silently. His men will scale the heights 
of the Plains of Abraham, lure the French troops out of their fortress at Quebec and General Montcalm, who is their commander at this point, and defeat them firmly in a battle known as the Plains of Abraham. At that battle, General Montcalm will lose his life, and that's basically a signal that it's all over for the French. General Wolfe will prevail with his brilliant strategy of utilizing the tide, and the British have finally captured the key prize, Quebec or Quebec City as we know it today. This leaves us about a year from the end of the war. Two more significant things will happen the next year in 1760. Robert Rogers and his rangers will regroup, and General Amherst, who doesn't particularly like him because he's a colonist and he Robert Rogers and his rangers are known for fighting like Indians, hiding behind trees, dressing in green uniforms. You can explore the websites related to Robert Rogers and his rangers. He'll order them on another reconnaissance mission, this time on Lake Champlain, to go up the Richelieu River and see how many forts lie between the northern end of Lake Champlain on the Richelieu, and Montreal on the northern end. Now, Robert Rogers and his rangers will be in a sloop, which is a large ship. They'll sail north on Lake Champlain. They'll anchor their ship near Isle Lamont, which is up on the northern end of the lake. Many of you are probably familiar with Isle Lamont. His men will go ashore on a place called Point Affair, Many of you may know where that is. You probably know where King's Bay is. They'll be spotted by French scouts. And in early June, a battle will ensue on Point Affair between Robert Rogers and his rangers and French forces that come off the Richelieu River. This is an unknown but very significant battle. And in fact, 10 years ago, I was involved in a commemoration of that and a reenactment of that battle on Point Affair because I lived there. But to make a long story short, Robert Rogers and his rangers firmly defeated the French forces that day. But was what was most significant about it, three Indian chiefs were killed. And when these three chiefs who represented Indian nations from the West out in the Great Lakes region who were allied with the French lost their chiefs, they did what was known as sue for peace, which means we're out of the war. We're going back with our tribe back to the Great Lakes where we came from. So because of Robert Rogers' victory in early June at Point Affair right in our backyard, the French lose a significant number of their Native American allies. He will then venture up on the Richelieu, attacking various forts, then report back to General Amherst that the Richelieu River between Montreal and the northern end of Lake Champlain is pretty lightly defended. This will open up the invasion and capture of the final prize, Montreal which is a small fur trading outpost at this point in history, in 1760. So on September 8th, 1760, the British will capture Montreal. And for all intents and purposes, that's the end of the French and Indian War. Even though fighting will linger on for three more years over in the European theater across the Atlantic. Now, the British did exactly what William Pitt set out to do. They firmly defeated the French. And for you to see this, the end results of it, turn to page 114 in your book, and you have two maps there. You have one map that shows you European claims in North America before 1754, which means before the French and Indian War. You have the other map that shows North America after the war. The color green signifies the French holdings in North America. You'll notice they have significant holdings before the war. You'll notice 
They basically have nothing after the war. It's very difficult to even see what they have. If you look closely, they can end up controlling half of the island of Hispaniola, the half known as St. Dominique, which we refer to today as Haiti. It remains a French colony. They also end up with fishing rights off the northern shore of Newfoundland. That's it. So, if you look at this map, see all the green? That's the French territory before the French and Indian War. See much green on that other map? The French were expelled from North America thanks to the French and Indian War. So, that's the end of the French and Indian War in the North Country. The next lecture that I'm going to uh, deliver to you is a lecture on how the French and Indian War led to, or as some historians would argue, caused the American Revolution to take place. So that's it for this lecture number two. Take care. Talk to you soon.